Today we are looking at a case from the late 19th century. So sit back as we go to France. Gabriel Bompard was born on the 13th of August, 1868, in the beautiful city of Lille in northern France. Her mother died when she was 13 years old, so she was brought up by her father, who worked as a metal dealer. When her father moved in his mistress, Gabrielle was sent away to boarding school. However, she frequently misbehaved, and each time she was moved on to a different school. She was described as being a girl with a lying disposition. Eventually fed up with her constant misdemeanours, her father arranged with the authorities to take Gabrielle into a corrective institute to try and teach her how a good citizen should conduct themselves in French society. However, it was hard for Gabrielle to comprehend what was actually required of her and she stayed in the institution until she was 18 years old. After returning to her father's house for a short time, she decided to go to Paris. She felt unwanted by her father and thought that she could make her way in the French capital. Paris, however, could be a hard and lonely place for a young woman with very little money, and she was soon noticed by the city's undesirable inhabitants. Thieves and conmen paid her particular attention. After a few days, she came across a man named Michel Leroux. He was intelligent, articulate, and 25 years older than her, having been born on March the 30th, 1843, in the city of saint Etienne in central eastern France. Michel had already had a very eventful life. He joined the army and served in Mexico during the second French intervention, but he eventually deserted and made his way to the USA. He stayed there until an amnesty allowed him to return to France. In 1870, he married, but he proved to be a poor and uncaring husband and soon left his wife. He spent the next 17 years occasionally working and often finding ways of parting honest gentlemen from their money. Michel was an accomplished linguist, so he would come over as a highly credible person to his unsuspecting victims. When he met the young and impressionable Gabriel Bompard, he was heavily in debt and looking for a way to make some quick money. He charmed the young lady with his stories of his travels and soon Gabrielle became his mistress. Together they walked along the Paris boulevards and frequented the cafes and restaurants. Michel seemed very proud of the young lady he had on his arm, but as his debts mounted, he needed a way of generating some money. He came up with a very old and simple plan. Gabrielle would lure a rich man to an apartment where they would rob and kill him. It would have to be someone who carried a substantial amount of cash. Michel had survived for many years one step ahead of the law, as he was very particular about working out every aspect of his crime, and this would be no exception. He instructed Gabrielle to rent a ground floor apartment. It had to be on the ground floor, so any footsteps or a falling body would not be heard by anyone living below. The couple then traveled to London and purchased a large trunk a very large cotton bag, some rope, a pulley, and some silk cord. When they returned to France, they went to the newly rented apartment, where Michel hammered the pulley into a crossbeam and hung a curtain across the alcove behind the bed. He then placed a chair behind the curtain. His plan was very elaborate. Gabrielle would take the unfortunate victim to the room, place his head playfully in the noose, and then Michel who would be hiding behind the curtain, would pull it, which would result in the man being strangled. Once everything was in place, Michel had to choose a suitably wealthy victim, one who carried large sums of money and who was susceptible to an attractive young lady. He decided that a very good target would be Toussaint Augustin Gouff. He was a 42-year-old widower who lived close to the center of Paris with his three daughters. He worked as a bailiff and process server, which meant that he often had large amounts of money in his possession. He would never leave any money in his office overnight, 
thinking it's safer to take it home with him. However, on Fridays he would go out into the city and not go back to his house, so would leave the money in the office and collect it the following morning. On the evening of the 26th of July, 1889, Monsieur Gouff went out to his usual Paris bar. Gabrielle was conveniently waiting there, and a few minutes after he entered, she struck up a conversation with him. They had a few drinks, then she lured him back to the apartment. Toussaint Augustine Gouff was never seen again. He was reported missing, and the police investigated his disappearance. The hall porter at his office confirmed that on Friday, July the 26th, at about 9pm, a man had entered the building and gone to Monsieur Gouff's office. A few minutes later he left, and when the porter tried to question him, he barged him away and hurried off. When the police examined the office, they found nothing missing, and a sum of 14,000 francs was hidden away behind some papers. The only strange thing were ten long matches that were lying half burnt on the floor. The police were convinced that something had happened to Monsieur Gouff and considered that the mysterious visitor to his office the night the gentleman had gone missing was someone they needed to speak to, but they did not know who he was. They spoke to Monsieur Gouff's friends and family and traced his movements on the night of the 26th of July, but their inquiries didn't lead them to any information that could help them identify a suspect. On the 29th of July, Michel Leroux and Gabriel Bompard left Paris and went to the port of Calais, where they took a boat to Dover. Michel travelled under the name Monsieur Labordet, and Gabriel claimed to be his teenage son. She had cut off her hair and made out that she was travelling as a boy with his father. A few days later, they boarded a transatlantic steamer heading for Canada. This time the couple travelled under the name Monsieur Vanillard and his daughter Bertha. Eight days later, they arrived in Quebec City. They did not want to stay in Canada for too long, and in an elaborate attempt to cover their tracks, they first went to Montreal, then travelled to Vancouver, before moving on to San Francisco. During the journey, they met a fellow Frenchman named Georges Garanger. He was obviously wealthy, and Michel immediately saw an opportunity to part an honest man from his money, so he encouraged Gabrielle to get close to him. Monsieur Garanger fell for the young lady's charm, and Michel gave her permission to travel with her new companion to San Francisco and agreed to meet them both in New York. This would give him enough time to work out a plan to rob him. However, a problem occurred when Gabrielle, who had never had anyone in her life who she could talk to and share her thoughts and feelings with, started to fall for the rich and handsome gentleman. She told him about Michel's criminal history and his plan to rob him in New York. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in France, a road worker in Vernation had found a large oilskin bag under a bush, and inside it was a body. An autopsy was carried out on August the 14th, and it was concluded that the deceased had died of strangulation at some point in the previous three to five weeks. There was no name for the deceased, and no one in Vernation which is a small city south of Lyon and nearly 500 kilometers from Paris, had reported anyone missing. Two days after the discovery of the body, the police who were searching the area came across a broken abandoned trunk. The smell was horrible, and when they inspected what remained of it, they concluded that it was probably the trunk that had transported the body. Further inspection revealed postal markings which indicated that it had come from Paris. The police in Vernation contacted the Paris police commissioner, a very well-respected gentleman named Monsieur Marie-Francois Goron. Commissioner Goron had no name for the deceased, but was determined to solve the intriguing crime. He quickly presumed that the murder had taken place in Paris and that the body had been transported in the trunk to Lyon, then dumped in the countryside near Vernation. He didn't have any real leads in the case, so he briefed the press 
on everything he knew so far and sent the trunk to be repaired. As news of the crime spread throughout Paris and the investigation intensified, the name Toussaint Agostin Goff was mentioned as a possible victim. He had gone missing shortly before the body and the trunk were discovered. The police interviewed his friends and family. A second autopsy was performed and this time the police were able to identify that the deceased was indeed Monsieur Goff. Previous injuries to his leg and ankle, along with dental records and hair colouring, confirmed beyond doubt that it was him. But who was responsible for the grisly crime? There were no suspects. The deceased had worked as a bailiff, so he would not have been popular amongst many people in Paris. When the repaired trunk was returned, Commissioner Goran ordered it to be placed in a Paris morgue for a week. Fascinated by the unsolved crime that had been constantly written about in the French newspapers, hundreds of people patiently waited in line every day to view it. With the case again back in the forefront of the public's mind, a witness came forward who informed the police that Michel Leroux had not been seen in Paris since Monsieur Goff had disappeared. He was immediately considered a suspect and investigated. They soon learnt that he had a mistress named Gabrielle Bompard and they could not find anyone who had seen either of them since the 29th of July. Commissioner Goran thought it probable that this couple could be connected to the murder of Monsieur Goff. The police had to tread carefully, however, as the Goff family had put up 500 francs to anyone who could identify the trunk. This had resulted in many suggestions from Parisians, hopeful of getting the reward. In December 1889, Commissioner Goran received a letter from the owner of a boarding house in London, who stated that he remembered the man named Michel Eru, accompanied by a young lady named Gabrielle, who had been guests in his establishment. He also stated that they left on the 14th of July, travelling by train to the port of New Haven and then taking a boat to France. He remembered her well, as she had purchased a large trunk in London and took it back with her, but it was almost completely empty. French detectives were dispatched to London, and the shop that sold the trunk to Michelle and Gabrielle was located in London's Euston Road. The shop owner confirmed that it had been purchased by a Frenchman on July the 12th, and even though it was six months since the purchase, the shop owner identified Michel Leroux as the buyer. The wife of the boarding house owner also identified him. Commissioner Goran thought that he had found the people responsible for the murder, but he did not know where exactly it had taken place. He presumed somewhere in Paris, but had no idea in which street or in which property. And where were Michel and Gabrielle? The police spoke to people who knew them, but no one had seen them for over six months. From their inquiries, the police learned that Michel was no stranger to going overseas. So presuming he may have done so again, Commissioner Goran contacted detectives in England, Canada and the USA. Soon after, Michel's photo was published in newspapers on the other side of the Atlantic. Michel Eru and Gabrielle Bompard had become two of the most wanted criminals of the time. As Gabrielle had grown so fond of the new gentleman in her life, instead of meeting Michel in New York, she insisted that she and Monsieur Garanger go back to France via Canada. When he agreed, she started to tell him the story of her tragic life and of how Michel was a con artist and a swindler and responsible for the death of Toussaint Agustin Gouff. On January 21st, 1890, Commissioner Goran received a letter from New York, and when he opened it, he was astonished to see that the sender was Michel Eru. Michel wrote that after seeing his picture in the papers, he wanted to inform the commissioner that he was completely innocent of any crime and that he had been a good friend of the deceased. He added that while in London he had purchased a large trunk for a young lady he knew named Mademoiselle Gabrielle Bompard, but she had later informed him that she had sold it. He had gone to America with the young lady as he found himself in a very poor financial position 
and wanted to take advantage of the better opportunities that he believed were available in New York. The letter went on to say that Mademoiselle Bompard had left him for another man, and even though she was someone he wished he had never met, he felt that she was innocent of any crime against Monsieur Goff. He signed off the letter by promising the commissioner that when Mademoiselle Bompard arrived in Paris, he would also return. The commissioner thought it remarkable that he received correspondence from his prime suspect, but the next day he was even more surprised when a young lady entered the police station and declared that she was Mademoiselle Gabrielle Bompard. She told the commissioner the whole story of how she had been an unwilling accomplice in the murder of Monsieur Gouff, but she also said that all she did was lure him back to the property. She knew nothing of what had happened after that. She confirmed that she had faith in the French justice system and wanted to return to Paris and bring Michel Leroux to justice. After signing her statement, Gabrielle Bompard was arrested. The press filled their front pages with the story and as the news of Gabrielle's arrest found its way to New York, Michel quickly left the city and went to Mexico. He didn't stay in Mexico for long before sailing to Cuba. Here he thought he would be safe and he would have time to consider what to do next. However, before he had the opportunity to make any further plans, he was recognized by a fabric merchant who reported him to the authorities. He was arrested and in June 1890, Michel was sent back to France. The trial of Michel Heroux and Gabriel Bompard took place before the Paris Aziz court on December the 16th, 1890, and was a talk of France. The prosecution outlined the events that took place. They established that on the 26th of July, 1889, Gabriel lured Monsieur Goff back to the apartment they had rented and placed a noose over his head. The plan went wrong when the pulley broke, so Michel took over and strangled the victim. However, he was not carrying very much money and all they could retrieve was a watch and 150 francs. Michel then went to the deceased man's office but failed to find any money and left empty-handed, not spotting the 14,000 francs that was on his desk. The following day, the couple took a train to Lyon. Once there, they rented a vehicle and drove to a wooded area where they dumped the body. Further down the road, Michel destroyed the trunk. Then, on July the 29th, they made their way to England, then on to Canada and the USA. The prosecution believed that this was an open and shut case. Both of the accused were guilty. But Gabrielle was not about to just lie down and admit that she was responsible for this horrific crime. She was also not going to lose her moment in the limelight. She arrived every day in court wearing a beautiful dress and would smile at photographers. She knew that the pictures the photographers took each day would be seen on the following day's front pages. The crowds cheered her. They seemed somewhat fascinated by her. And as the press used her to sell even more newspapers, it started to become clear that public sentiment was moving in her favor. No longer viewed as a calculating murderess, she was now looked at as the young innocent victim of a man twice her age. Gabrielle pleaded extenuating circumstances and told the court that Michelle had hypnotized her. Witnesses testified that since she was a child, she had had the ability to fall into a deep sleep during hypnotic seances. One French newspaper printed the headline, Murder Under Hypnosis, and for the first time in France, hypnosis was used as a defense in a criminal trial. The central question was whether the vulnerable 21-year-old Gabrielle Bompard was guilty of murder, or was she under the hypnotic powers of Michel Heroux? Michel, however, blamed the murder on the calculating and cunning Mademoiselle Bompard. He said that he was captivated by her and just carried out her instructions. He was aware that all the evidence was against him and had resigned himself to being found guilty. But if he was going to face the guillotine, 
He was determined to make sure that Gabrielle did as well. He felt that she had betrayed him. When the trial ended, the jury went out to deliberate, and when they returned a few hours later, the jury foreman stood up, and when he was asked if the jury found the defendant, Michel Eru, guilty or not guilty, the foreman replied, guilty, and the judge sentenced him to death. When the judge asked if the jury found the defendant, Gabriel Bompard, guilty or not guilty, the foreman replied, guilty, but due to extenuating circumstances, and the judge sentenced her to 20 years hard labour. Michel appealed his sentence, but his attempts to get it commuted were unsuccessful, and in the morning of the 3rd of February, 1891, Michel Eru went to the guillotine. After sentencing, Gabrielle was sent to the female prison in Nanterre before being moved to the prison in Clermont. She was released in 1905 after serving 15 years. By the time she was released, the case that had dominated the Paris newspapers in 1890 had largely been forgotten and she lived out her life in obscurity before dying in the early 1920s. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next Brief Case.